a couple of organizational points. The first one is uh, I would ask the speakers to come here to the podium and to talk from here. Uh, questions and answers can be handled uh, at the table, but because we have the recording, it would be convenient for the recorders to uh, record the presenters that are speaking from the podium. The second one is uh, there is a Biruz Galegi. Biruz, can you please you know, identify yourself? Uh, we are managing the project together. So we're managing this project on macroeconomic policies, and I'm asking Biruz to chair this session uh, since I'm the speaker as well, the first session. Uh, and uh, 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 without, uh, uh, the, uh, without further uh, remarks, let me come right to the point. What is the reason for the project? The reason for the project is the idea that for developing countries, macroeconomic policies are supposed to be different from macroeconomic policies in developed countries. And there are several reasons for that. One reason is that the Western countries and the Southern countries have different interests. Sometimes they have common interests, but sometimes the interests are different. And if there is a conflict of interest between the rest and the rest, then macroeconomic policies would be different uh, in, in a very natural way. For instance, during the Great Recession of 2008-2009, the United States were telling other countries not to expand the money supply, not to have the government budget deficit, and not to bail out the banks. But uh, uh, they did exactly that. So this was the policy which was uh, supposed to be advertised as do as we say, not do as we do. Another example would be undervaluation of the exchange rate. You know, there is an ongoing conflict with China. The United States think that China is a currency manipulator, underprices the exchange rate, but China thinks this is good for Chinese development. But even if the interests are the same, even if we accept <coughs> excuse me, the position of benevolent social planner, the expression that economists like very much, even if we think that our goal is to maximize the welfare in the whole world, and even if we think that the welfare of the people in the South is as important as the welfare of the people in the West, then the macroeconomic policies and other policies are supposed to be different. And uh, 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 the uh, maxima that uh, what is good for the goose is good for the gander does not work. There are special conditions in developing countries. There are greater price rigidities. There are uh, special tasks of developing countries from the idea that they are supposed to catch up. And that's why macroeconomic policies are supposed to be different. Here are the main hypotheses. You uh, uh, probably looked at the website, and there is a concept note, and the concept note spells out the main hypothesis which we're willing to put on the table to discuss today. Of course, there may be other hypotheses as well. And the first hypothesis is about the government spending and the effects of the fiscal policy. Usually we talk about the uh, Keynesian effects of the fiscal policy. If there is a unemployment and if there are, there are unused production capacities, then fiscal expansion can help bring the economy to the level of potential output. The actual output will increase and there would be, uh, the economy will expand and will operate at the level of potential output. However, uh, there is another effect. And the, another, the other effect is uh, the one that moves the supply curve. Uh, if we uh, look at the usual chart that we present to the students, there is a demand curve and the supply curve, and there is something when the uh, demand curve moves to the right, then the output expands and prices increase. And at the price of inflation, you can increase the output in the economy. But there is something which is, there are some shocks which are associated, supply shocks. And there is a very unpleasant shock which is called uh, the adverse supply shock. And if you have large cuts in government spending, and this is what happened in transition economies, then there is a large supply shock to the economy. Why? Because the, the classical example is that law and order is not being insured. Normally the government should provide law and order. It is not, it is not supposed to be provided by private agents. It is less efficient than it is provided by private agents. If the government is not providing law and order in government administration and healthcare services and education, then there is a supply shock to the economy. The private companies are supposed to do it themselves. And this costs more. And then there is an increase in costs, and every increase in costs is a supply shock. And then we have the movement of the aggregate supply curve to the left, and this is just about the worst kind of shock that can be because prices get higher and the output gets lower. Now, uh, normally we don't have experiments in social sciences and in economics, but 
uh, there was this natural experiment in 1990s during transition. Transition is the transition of communist countries, former communist countries, from centrally planned economy to a market economy. There was a large decline. This natural experiment showed quite a bit. There was a large decline in some countries, in most of the countries. This is Central Europe, but in other parts of the world, in former Soviet Union countries, and even in China, there was a decline in government spending as compared to GDP. Very pronounced decline in government spending as compared to GDP. If you look at, if you divide all the government spending into something which is called the ordinary government, which is everything, with the exception of functions that were typical for the central planned economy, but not really, or better to say, with the functions that do not affect the institutional capacity of the state. Debt service payments, defense, subsidies, investment, this is something that doesn't affect institutional capacity, and this capacity is something that is governed by the expenditure on the ordinary government, which includes government administration, healthcare, uh, education, law and order, things like that. Then you will see that in some countries, like you know, Russian, in Russia, for instance, the decline in the expenditure of ordinary government as a percentage of GDP. Remember, GDP went down by 50%. And then there was a decline in the share of government spending on the ordinary government in GDP. So in real terms, the expenditure for the ordinary government went down by something like two thirds, which means that if you have a hundred policemen in one particular city, now you have only 30 something policemen in this particular city. That's why the murder rate went up dramatically. And the contracts and uh, uh, property rights were not enforced. And the companies had to enforce contracts and property rights themselves, hiring the guards. Or the debt service companies that were trying to collect debt collection, companies that were trying to collect the debts if the debts were not paid. And this created the atmosphere in which the economy did not operate that well. And part of the collapse of output was associated exactly with that reason. Now, this is on the uh, horizontal scale. This is declining in the share of government revenues and GDP uh, in the beginning of 1990s. And on this scale, there is a dynamics of output. In most countries, except for China and Vietnam, output fell. So in 1996, it was below 1989. This was transformational recession. And there was a link between the collapse of the government and the decline in output. If you remember, the debates in transition were about the speed of transition. What is better, gradual transition like in China or shock therapy treatment like in Poland and Central European countries? Well, it turns out that this was not the major story. Today, there is more and more economists that realized that the major story was not the market failure, it was the government failure. It was the collapse of the government. And the decline in output was associated with the collapse of the government. Yes, the speed of the reforms had some influence on the performance, but the major performance was the collapse of the government. When the government collapses, the output collapses as well. And this is not the regular Keynesian effect. No, this is the effect that the public goods are supposed to be provided by the government, and when the government doesn't provide public goods, output collapses. If you don't believe me, there are some calculations and there are papers about it, and this is from the paper of your, uh, 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 your humble servant. The dependent variable here is the GDP in 96 as compared to GDP in 89, the collapse of GDP, but of course in countries like China, and China is one of these 28 countries, this is cross-country regressions. In China there was an increase in GDP. Now, you can see liberalization index. If it is in brackets, it means it is not significant. The statistics is bad. But uh, the decline in government spending, government revenues. Why revenues? Because when, uh, if you take the government spending, then there is an impact of the deficit. If the deficit is very high, then usually there is high inflation. There is another effect. So just to brush it off, uh, uh, I consider only the decline in government revenues. And the decline in government revenues is always significant. You can use the other measures of the institutional capacity of the state, like the shadow economy, percentage of shadow economy in 1994. It is also significant. It explains the decline in output. And if uh, here is the chart about the average share of government revenues in GDP and the increase in the shadow economy, you can see in countries where the government revenues were high, like in Central European countries, Czech, Hungary, Poland, uh, and Estonia, by the way, also Belarus is, of course, not a Central European country. It is very different, but these countries are very different in all the other dimensions. But in this dimension, they are uh, pretty much close to one another. And in these countries, the increase in the shadow economy, in the share of the shadow economy, was low. But in other countries where the government collapsed, the shadow economy 
uh, popped up. So it was like the government retreats and the shadow economy comes in. This was the story of transition. So this is the natural experiment which we didn't have for quite some time in human history. And I think uh, in many countries, in many African countries or Latin American countries, there may be an argument that because, you know, if you look at the murder rates, for instance, in Latin America, this would be 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 60 in Colombia at one point. If you look at the murder rates per 100,000 of inhabitants, if you look at the murder rates in European countries, one, two, three, right? These are, this, the, the difference is the order of magnitude. And of course, this is the, uh, one of the indicators of the institutional capacity of the state. What is the state? The monopoly of violence. If there is no monopoly on violence, if this is violated, right, then the state doesn't operate. So once the state doesn't do the job, this, is, this brings the actual output below the potential output. So far, so good. The other uh, hypothesis that we have is about price rigidities and the inflation rates in different countries. What should be the inflation rates? Today, the uh, conventional wisdom is inflation targeting. You do the inflation targeting, you have 2% inflation every year, no matter what happens with your economy. Maybe it's good for the goose, but it's not good for the gander that lives in southern countries. Right? Why? Because price rigidities are higher, uh, the markets don't operate that well, and if prices are sticky, then, and if you have adverse supply shocks, then having the inflation targeting and 2% inflation uh, will, it, it, this is something that may destroy your uh, output and bring it below the level of potential output. Now, uh, uh, there is a famous article by Michael Bruner and William Easterly, uh, which is from 1996, but it was published in 1990, 1995, I think. It was published in 1988. They look at the impact of inflation on output in different countries, and they find out that uh, if inflation is higher than 40%, it is always bad. But when it is in between 20 and 40%, uh, we cannot say much. And when it goes below 20%, actually it has a suppressive effect on output. And uh, uh, then there were more accurate studies, and they found the threshold. The threshold of inflation, uh, when the uh, further suppression of inflation has a negative effect on output. And it turns out that this threshold is higher in developing countries than in developed countries. Uh, usually, these are the charts that uh, I was, I'm usually showing to the students. I say, here is the inflation and output growth. And you can see uh, blue is inflation and inflation rates, and uh, pink is GDP growth rates. And this is the chart for Russia. And so what we see, inflation is bad for growth. When inflation is high, growth is low. When inflation is low, growth is high, right? But then I show them the chart for China. And it seems like China uh, proves exactly the opposite point. When inflation is high, the growth is high. Uh, it is lagged one year, right? Growth rates are leg lagged one year after inflation. And when inflation is low, the growth is low. And of course, this is, the, this is what we teach, right? This is the regular effect. This is called the Phillips curve. Yes, the Phillips curve is such that, uh, you know, you can buy uh, some uh, points of economic growth, of GDP growth, by uh, uh, increasing inflation. And there are reasons for that. Uh, but the uh, answer to the question why for Russia, we see one relationship, and for China, we see a different relationship, is uh, that uh, the rates of inflation are very different. Right? In Russia, it was a thousand, thank you so much, a thousand uh, percent, a several hundred percent, and this inflation is always bad for growth, right? And uh, I can spell out reasons for that. This is actually the movement of supply curve. And in China, <coughs> uh, this was the low inflation. And the low inflation, when inflation is low, then uh, the relationship is the one that is in the textbooks, and that's exactly the uh, inflation story of Phillips curve. Now, the third hypothesis, I'll just name it because we're going to have a special presentation. We have a paper, Birus Galegi, uh, Viktor Polterovich, and your obedient servant have a paper about the independence of the central banks and economic growth. There is a huge literature about independence of the central banks and inflation. 
And it is kind of proven that when you have very independent central bank, this is the index of independence of the central bank. This is Switzerland, Germany, USA, the most independent central banks in the world. Then your inflation is low. This is inflation for the period 55 to 88. Uh, but uh, for economic growth, there is another relationship, and it's not always uh, the same. It's different for different countries, and this is going to be discussed in the paper that was going to be presented by the Rus. And uh, the other hypothesis is that countries with flexible monetary policy manage adverse supply shocks better, especially if there are wage and price rigidities. Because my time is coming to an end, let me just, uh, 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 let me just uh, uh, do it very quickly. Uh, the quick story, it's basically the story of Greece. Greece doesn't, Greek tragedy, Greece doesn't have its own currency. And uh, countries like, say, Poland, the Czech Republic, or Hungary, in the recent recession, in the Great Recession, they had their own currency. They devalued. Greece was not able to devalue because there was no currency. That's the same currency, Euro. And many uh, East European countries, which were already entering Euro, before you enter Euro, you adopt something which is called the exchange rate mechanism, and then there are uh, limits by how much you can move your currency and by how much your inflation may be different from other countries and so on. There are conditions. So here, uh, some East European countries like Latvia and Estonia and um, uh, uh, Lithuania, uh, uh, these countries did not devalue because they were not able to devalue. They had their own currency, but they were not able to devalue. So how you react to external shock? If there is an outflow of capital, if there is deterioration of the terms of trade, your trade balance, your capital account balance, deteriorates, and what do you do? You devalue, or you take the blow without devaluation. If you take the blow without devaluation, then it is internal devaluation, how the economists call it. It's the decline in prices and uh, in wages that is supposed to happen. And this is the mechanism that works. Uh, you have uh, trade balance deteriorates, capital account balance deteriorates, the foreign exchange reserves fall, money supply falls, domestic prices fall, real exchange rate uh, the theory, uh, goes down, and <clears throat> uh, what is supposed to happen is the trade balance improves, and then the capital balance also improves. <laughs> Excuse me. But this is the very costly process, because for this process to operate, your wages and your prices are supposed to go down. Prices and wages are less flexible than the exchange rate, especially in larger countries, in countries which are large. So when your, ex your prices and wages are going down, your output also goes down. And you can see that, uh, well, this is a nice citation from Paul Krugman, who said that Latvia, he even wrote about Latvia, you know, nobody knows where Latvia is, but Paul Krugman wrote about Latvia because he said it's like Argentina, it's a little bit wonky, because it repeats exactly the Argentinian story. The Argentinian story with the currency board in 2001. Uh, Bresser Pereira is here, and uh, I'm sure he knows a lot about Argentinian story, more than I do, and he will not allow me to, uh, to pull your leg. Uh, the Argentinian story was, the story of bringing down inflation with a currency board, but also bringing down output because it was internal devaluation. And just to show you the uh, other chart, you know, some countries in transition that did not devalue had the largest reduction of output in the Great Recession of 2007, 2009. These are the, out of 42 countries, uh, that experienced a reduction of output in this period, 13 were transition economies, and most of them did not devalue. Most of them did, did not have the uh, flexible exchange rates. So, uh, by the way, uh, Russia had this story in 1998 when it had the currency crisis. Also, there was no devaluation and the output fell without any other reason, the output just fell. And after devaluation, it started to increase. Uh, this was a mini recession. And this is the countries that devalued, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary devalued. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, go to the very last hypothesis, which is exchange rate undervaluation through accumulation of foreign exchange reserves promotes export-oriented growth in developing countries. Because export to GDP ratios in these countries are generally below the optimal level. Now, usually, once again, there is a normal Keynesian effect with a devaluation. We're talking here not about the Keynesian effect. We're talking here about the long-term impact of undervalued exchange rate on economic growth. And this impact is actually the industrial policy impact. I'm going to have a presentation with a, of a paper. We have a paper together with Viktor Polterovich, and in, after lunch, I'm going to talk more about it. But it's interesting that I cannot resist the lure in the last minute that I have 
to show you the, uh, uh, the um, we have uh, Xin Xiaoping and we have uh, uh, Leon Liu here, uh, the two Chinese that will not allow me, you probably know this uh, uh, picture. This is the remake of the famous Russian picture. The Russian picture is by, by Ilya Repin uh, and uh, this is a painter of the late 19th, early 20th century. And this painting is called uh, We Did Not Expect You, or Unexpected Visitors. And uh, this is the revolutionary that comes from the exile from Siberia or somewhere. And uh, uh, he comes uh, after a you know, long, prolonged period of absence. And here are the children. You know, this, uh, the boy probably is older. He recognizes him. The girl does not recognize him. This is the uh, governess who teaches the children and so on. But the remake says that Mao Zedong, together with two heroes of the Red Lantern, which is the opera, the Chinese opera, Beijing opera. Uh, they are railway workers, it's called the Red Lantern, so they come, they assist Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong comes to take back the gold, which China invested into American treasury bills. And the gold is managed by uh, George Bush, and, who, and who, who, who did it? This is Jiang Zemin's portrait is on the, on, the, um, on the wall, and these are the two liberal economists. The children are the two liberal economists that were supporting this policy. So this policy is very much criticized. Underpricing the exchange rate by accumulating the reserves is a policy that is very much criticized in China, not only in the United States, but also by the leftists in China. But I would argue that this policy makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, the reserves are very different in those countries. In Congo, this is also only, you know, several percent of GDP. In Botswana, for the long period of time, it's not one year, it's 1960, 1999, yes, the whole period. In Botswana, it's nearly the whole GDP. It's nearly 70% of GDP. So this needs to be explained, why the reserves are so different. There are objective reasons for that, but there are policy reasons for that. And there is some evidence that the accumulation of reserves spurs growth. I'm going to give you this evidence, and I'm leaving you with this main hypothesis. Uh, thank you so much, and may I please suggest you to take the floor.